Moving on from the past three videos in this series, today I wanted to try and cover off on two topics, which would be early commissioning. Now that we've distributed all our controllers across the plant room, we don't have you know, 10 controllers in a, in a central location. How can we use that for early commissioning? And secondly, I wanted to talk a little bit about fire and smoke interlocks, which since the first video with the hand of auto switches, that question has been coming up every video. So today we will address that. And next week I wanna talk about distributed power. When we've transitioned into distributed controls as step one, and you get your head around that and test it on a few small jobs, appropriate jobs to test it like that on, and you then move into distributed power, that's like a major game changer. That is when the whole thing changes. Like distributed controls, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it has its advantages, but when you distribute the power, and that's when the mech board comes away completely, that's when things really start to change. So keep an eye out for that one, which will be the last video in the series. Um, I really want to move on from this topic. I guess originally I intended just to record the head of auto switch video. Um, that weekend, you know, a few weeks ago, it was a Sunday, I was moving. There were just boxes everywhere. The room at my office wasn't set up and I was running out of time, so I just you know, put the camera up in the lounge, um, record the video, and I was just gonna be done with it. But once I released the video, I was thinking, look, really, it's, it's a quite an interesting topic, but it doesn't really tell the full story. So this, this, this series just has grown arms and legs over the last few weeks. I wanna finish it off and then move on to some other topic uh, in two weeks' time. So we'll finish off next week. Okay, early commissioning. Now, a lot of you, I think, are actually starting to get an idea what it's about. So I've had a few messages on YouTube, so I think a lot of you have picked this up already or have actually have tried this already. What we're gonna do is, in this plant room, where we have our air handling unit, our one control in the box, and, you know, 60% pre-wired, nothing else going on. When I was doing this a few years ago, when I was a BMS project manager, before consulting land, um, plant rooms would always have these temporary power boards in them and people would be using these to charge you know batteries for drills or you know, the pipe fitters would be you know cutting something pipes and things some task lighting whatever it was so there was always this temporary power now i'm not sure where that came from that temporary power may have came from a generator or possibly they had the um the switch room powered up early and they just had this temporary power but there isn't power across the site yet so what you could do is get a small box put a transformer in there, a couple of circuit breakers, an extension lead. So you plug the extension lead into the temporary power board and you, you drag it off across to where your control panel is and you just put the 24 volts into your little control box. So you're pretty much only powering up 24 volts AC across the air handle. There's no 240 volts powered up there. That's what I used to do. I had a comment on YouTube last week uh, or a few days ago where someone was saying, look, they just used to use a a standard desktop UPS, which is a great idea. I never thought about that. I've been thinking about you know, getting two 12 volt lithium ion batteries in, um, in series, but yeah, of course, you know, like a, a desktop UPS would be great. You just power it up overnight, get a little trolley, put your UPS on the trolley, or use this temporary power supply, which I've just described. You could even put a little network controller or a gateway on there and, you know, go the next step, on the bottom of the trolley, just put a desktop computer, which you would call your, your temporary server, running the server application. So when you, you push your trolley up to this error handling unit and you power up the 24 volts through the, the desktop UPS or via this temporary power lead, you could actually you know, get the controller online, download it and get it as an online device in the network controller and your graphic for that AHU could you know, come online, all the points come online. So. Just a little bit of pre-planning of your engineering phase in the months approaching, other than downloading the program, addressing the controller, and sort of pre-commissioning those inputs and outputs, you could really get the device online in the network controller. And even if you don't have all your floor plan graphics and you know hundreds and hundreds of graphics, if you just had those AHU single page graphics of that plant room, they could become online. Because I think all of us know that one of the issues that we do is we we, we have our commissioning techs go in early and you know, commission the controllers and download everything. And it always seems to be a second phase when engineering catches up 
where we download, you know, uh, the, you know, the network controllers and all the graphics and we do all the graphic binding. It's almost like the second phase of commissioning, which never gets done properly because that's usually a month before handover or so. And the software engineers are flat out writing bits and pieces of stuff and trying to catch up with the last few plant rooms. It would be a really good idea to actually in that one shot commission those points, all the points, or 80% of the points, or 60% of the points, back through to a graphic, end of line, one shot done. So when you come around later on with permanent power in the plant room and you know your your all your power supplies have replicated through and your back net MSTP has gone through, and everything else is installed, those points completely commissioned, don't have to ever look at them again. Now, a lot of that isn't really rocket science. Um, a lot of you are, a lot of people are already doing that or you already worked it up yourself leading up to this video. What I want to touch on here, which is super critical, is that when you power up a box early, a lot of people have a heart attack. So the builder or the head contractor sees flashing the lights on a controller at panic stations. The main electrical contractor also gets a bit scared by that. And here in, in Australia, in our state called Victoria, for some reason, the unions are still quite strong here compared to other states in Australia and probably in the rest of the world. So you, the union will absolutely shut you down if you try and do this. And when I have done this before on real life big projects, the real work was providing a solution that everybody else would actually accept and not pull you up on. So you need to go and create a little five page temporary energization procedure document that you're gonna submit for approval to the builder and the electrical contractor and the union if you have them the months in advance. Uh, you cannot go into commissioning phase and temporary commissioning phase without a three month build up plan. It, it just will not happen. If people are unsure, they'll just reject it. So in that um, procedure, you need to describe in there what your pre-checks would be. If these panels were tested at the workshops beforehand, provide a little sheet that says, you know, AG control panel and G1-1, whatever, you know, it was powered up and tested in the workshop. When you get to site here, have a little sheet that says, you know, um, you got a certificate from your installer to say the cables are all installed and been continuity tested. Before you power the panel up, do some short circuit testing on cables, just do some sort of stuff. Maybe actually in this procedure, have an A4 copy of a printed out sheet that you're gonna stick on the control panel that says, you know, um, temporary live commissioning underway. Phone so-and-so and their phone number, 24 volts AC live circuits. Have a little thing like that. If you go to the effort to do that and you look professional in front of your client, the mechanical contractor and the rest of the stakeholders on site, they're gonna take you more seriously than them just walking through a plant room and just seeing your commissioning guys commissioning away and surprising them. So this discussion around the, the uh, temporary commission and early commissioning, there's a technical component around it. You know, where does the power supply come from? The UPS, the trolley, the gateway, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. But a lot of the focus and a lot of the work has to be on winning over the other stakeholders that are gonna be surprised by this. So start working on that first. All right, let's get this out of the way, fire and smoke. At the moment, where our mechanical board is and our BMS controllers, there's a whole bunch of fire interface relays or fire interface modules at that point. Why didn't the mechanical board? Lots and lots of relays. When we removed the handoff auto switch and we distributed our controller onto the air handling unit, the VSD start signal comes directly from the BMS controller's digital output. So that circuit, it's not in the mech board anymore. So where traditionally we had the hand of order switch and all the fire override ons in parallel with uh, the hand of order switch and all the fire interlock offs, you know, fireman's override off, uh, general fire alarm, you know, smoke detected in the duct, they were all just in series just before the relay. That circuit doesn't exist anymore. So we need to move that away from there. And there's sort of two ways to do this. My preferred method is to take that red uh, fire network and run it around the whole plant room past all the air handling units and then put one or two fire interface relays at every single air handling unit. Now, of course, that costs money and coordination and is hard work. But we have to remember that this whole journey to transition into distributed controls 
and next week distributed power, it's not there to save money. A lot of you would be thinking two weeks ago, hey, like, you know, we could, we could save some money here by not having the Mac board. This is gonna cost you the same money or more money. The objective is not to save money and win more jobs and differentiate ourselves from our competitors. The objective is to free up a month of commissioning, finish on time, on budget, and be a hero. That's what the objective is here. So run that red cable all the way around and have interfaces on all the air hand units. The second option is, which I haven't done, is you could leave all those fire interfaces in that one location and then just take those signals and distribute them across to all the air hand units, which means that you would, you know, you would have an early install on your BMS components and then later on, you know, a few months later in the plant room, you'd start running your back that MSTP network around and you start, you know, taking these uh, fire signals. So if you had a fire relay called general fire alarm, those contacts would switch 24 volts on one pair of cables all the way around past all the air handling units with a relay inside each one of those boxes. And when this relay dropped out, the 24 volts dropped out, all the relays dropped out, all the variable speed drives stopped. That little box that we had, it's not such a little box, uh, like I said last week. It's actually about this big, that box. Because all of those relays that were in the mech board, they've got to go somewhere. And they all go into these boxes. So now in Australia, it's a bit different because we have zero HVAC safety interlocking. Probably because that costs money. In other countries, you still have that. So if where you live, you have, you know, um, on your air handling, you'd have a high humidity stat as a high humidity interlock above, you know, 80%. Hardwired shuts down the humidifiers, or if you have a pressure switch on the supply duct that if all the VAVs close and the pressure goes over a thousand pascals, you hardwired shut the VSD down. Um, if you have a chiller plant room with high pressure safeties, low pressure safeties, you know, boiler, thermal links, plant room knock off buttons, a lot of countries have all those safeties still, so we don't have them. So in your box. You can have a bit of din rail there with all those relays. You know, general fire alarm, you know, fireman's override on, fireman's override off, if those are those critical AHUs, and then all these little relays, and they're all gonna hardwire into the variable speed drive. The reason why I sort of bring that up is that um, what we currently do here in Australia actually isn't great. So what we do is, at the mechanical board, we have the handle forward switch and all these safeties. That relay at the bottom that energizes the variable speed drive Every single job, we wire that into the VSD's normal start digital input. A lot of you are thinking, what? That's how we do it here. I've reviewed a lot of mechanical boards to sign them off and have commented that's an issue and I was getting ignored all the time um, because I was novated to the builder. Go watch those videos. So what happens here in Australia is if you walk past the air handling unit and you push the stop button on the variable speed drive stop button, that has a higher priority and overrides the, the normal digital input one or whatever it is for the start. So what happens there is you push the thing off because you're doing maintenance or whatever it is or it's faulty or blah, blah, blah. Okay, not faulty, but some, some other reason. And the fire alarm goes off and that really goes click, that VSD will not start. The same applies to if I, um, if I walk past the VSD and I push the hand start button, which from previous videos, remember, if the, if the Mac board hand off auto switch goes to manual, it enables a minimum speed, you've got to go there and push that hand start button and ramp it up. When you do that, and that's been forgotten about for two months running a manual, when the fire alarms go off in Australia the way we do it, that start signal is ignored. So that fan will continue to run in fire mode and mess up all the smoke control system because of how we do it. When we distribute it across the way, which we're about here, and we have fire interfaces, relays in your board, what happens is, the BMS digital output normal start signal goes into variable speed drive digital input one, for example, but the Feynman's override on contact wires into a different digital input, let's say digital input two, and when it's activated, the variable speed drive starts in fire mode. And when it's running in fire mode, it can be set to run to destruction. So if it's running, and there's smoke everywhere and fire everywhere, and it's getting some warnings, you know, it's high temperature or some phases or whatever it is, it'll ignore those warnings and it will just run that motor until the VSD 
catches on fire. The same applies that the you know the fireman's override off relay or the, the the relay for GFA or whatever it is. It's wired into a different digital input on the variable speed drive. The third one, when that point gets activated, the variable speed drive will stop no matter what. Even if it's overridden on on the the keypad, it'll stop. The reason why I'm sort of banging on about this is that the way we currently do it, it's not a great way of doing it. In my mind, it probably isn't even compliant. I'm not sure about that. I'm not a fire engineer. This moving to distributed controls and distributing the fire signals, it, there are some other advantages to it working slightly better. Now, as a side note to, to all these videos, um, do not try and do this on a 30-story building, like, of course, right? So what I would do if I was you is, you know, you've, you've coordinated with a mechanical contractor six months ago. When we win a job together, we're going to do this. This is the idea. We love it. Yeah, do a few tests. On this job, massive chiller plant room. You know, there's six chillers in there, five cooling towers. Don't do it in there. Just have a standard mechanical board. All the controls one place, normal installation. Boiler plant room, three massive boilers, standard way. However, in that plant room down there, there's only four AHUs in there. Let's test it on there. Let's get rid of the mech board. Let's distribute our controllers onto the AHUs. Let's try this out. Let's get the fire signals across. Do whatever you have to do. You know, you will learn lessons from doing that. It took me a long time. When, when I did this for the first time, I was, I was working for a BMS company as a design engineer, and I was employed by a builder. And in the north of England, they had spent two years doing this. So they wanted to do it in the south of England. So I was employed to do design and work through this principle. So I had a head start. Those guys had done, you know, a couple of jobs already. And, you know, so it was like, let's say it's a two or three year cycle to actually d to deliver a massive hospital like this. But, you know, if you've got it, you, it's like small steps. So one step at a time, start up just testing it out. Like the first thing you want to do is, like I still see fan core units, supplementary fan core units with mech boards. Go on level seven, open up the electrical riser. There's a box there, hand off auto switches, one of fault lamps for fan corners. Absolutely crazy, crazy. Especially when you have these uh, EC motors, just give it a permanent power supply. So start thinking about it, talk to people and test it out one step at a time. Start on a small shopping center. Do not start on a hospital or a data center or anything like that. So that's that, uh, commissioning fire and smoke. Now guys, this is obviously just, you know, these are YouTube videos, this is like intent. We're not doing a tutorial here around resolving every problem. You guys will have different problems in different countries, depending on what your regulations are, electrical regulations, blah, blah, blah. So just work through it, consider the concept. Next week, we're gonna talk about distributed power. So keep an eye out for that one. Thank you for watching, have a good week.